move into our last keynote presentation of the morning, featuring co-founder and CTO of Casa, Jameson Lopp, talking about the perils of premature protocol ossification. And what I understand that means is, will Bitcoin adapt? Can Bitcoin scale? Can we move into a future where we evolve with this technology? And I think the answer is yes. So I'm excited to introduce Jameson Lopp, who's going to set up his presentation and then take it away. Everybody, warm welcome, please. Can we, can everybody hear me? Is my mic working? Can I, there we go, all right. Now we're in business. All right, I'm Jameson Lopp. Uh, let's dive right into it because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, so what is ossification? Uh, protocol ossification is the loss of flexibility, extensibility, and really the ability for a network protocol to evolve. This is generally an issue of forward compatibility and it's, it's very uh, difficult to write protocols that will uh, still work. Oh, yes, that, that'll probably help if we, if we can there. Uh, so it's very difficult for protocols uh, to evolve and be uh, compatible with future versions of themselves because this requires the users to upgrade their software and uh, communicate with the rest of the network you know, using the same protocol, essentially the same language. As the network grows, this becomes more and more difficult uh, because there's no single authority that controls the entire network and can force everyone to upgrade to the new version of the protocol. Essentially what happens to network protocols is their ability to update is crushed under the, the weight and the inability to coordinate amongst all of the different users of that protocol. So ossification is a major issue in all internet protocol design and deployment, and this can prevent updates from happening, or it can place restrictions on the design of new protocols and uh, the ways that you can make updates to already deployed protocols. Some good examples of this are the transmission control protocol, TCP, or the user datagram protocol, which is UDP. As of today, these are the only two practical choices of ways to transport data across the internet, and they have both significantly ossified over the decades, making the extension and modification of them basically impossible. Now, another protocol that's ossified is SMTP, which you probably know as email, and this ossification has had massive consequences, which we'll get into now. So, we won't talk about exactly how SMTP works, but you can see here that it's a very simple client-server protocol, straightforward sort of back and forth communication, messages going between the sender and the recipient. Early email treated all of these messages the same regardless of their content, and every email user was essentially equal. As long as you followed the rules to the protocol, you could expect your message to reach its destination. We can see, uh, you know, won't go into all of the details, but it was a, uh, a fairly simple back and forth, like 10 step process. And as long as you did these things, it was gonna work for you. So what happened? Well, for the first few decades, email was only used by a few hundred, maybe a few thousand people, it was a very niche thing. But in the 90s, AOL came along, and we had this massive surge, millions of adopters of email. And what came along with that? Well, spam. And as it turns out, email as a protocol was designed to ensure the delivery of mail, not to prevent it. So the assumption that all messages would be desired by a recipient was something that changed. The, really, the nature and the game of email changed. So what happened? We had to adapt. 
Uh, with the, the rise of email abuse, ISPs started taking measure to try to stop the spam. Uh, one of the early things they did was naive content filtering. Uh, in some cases, beige and filtering, getting a little bit more complex, like looking for keywords, patterns, so on and so forth. And uh, Spam Assassin, this is like a rule set from Spam Assassin, had over a thousand different rules to it. However, uh, it was only partially affected. Uh, effective, these measures were inaccurate, they created a lot of false positives, and emails were routine, routinely being filtered and blocked even though they were not spam, they were actually desired by the recipients. The ISPs, they tried their best to improve these things by either guessing what the users might want or uh, by using uh, you know, attempts to create more convoluted filtering mechanisms. But all of these mechanisms ended up failing spectacularly. We ended up with a com an explosion of complexity as providers were kind of scraping by with these ad hoc filters. But then, what happened in the 2000s? Well, high-speed residential internet connections came online. So spammers actually changed tactics. They started writing malware to infect people's home computers and sending the email out of their residential networks because most ignorant users would have no idea their computer was affected. So what happened as a result of that? ISPs started blocking all traffic on port 25, which was the SMTP port. That was the only way they could really figure how to cur curtail this flood of spam. But of course, it didn't end there. Uh, we ended up having more and more complex stuff getting created, eventually settling on what was more of a reputation-based system. Uh, email service providers and ISPs ended up teaming up to create reputation systems. I actually spent the first decade of my career working at an email service provider. You know, it worked all right, uh, but you know, the abuse continued. It was, it was often very difficult to be able to prove the claims uh, of senders that they weren't spammers. So we ended up developing these things called like sender score, uh, reputation systems that were built around different companies that created their own proprietary algorithms. Um, you saw stuff around sender authentication mechanisms like sender policy framework, sender ID, domain keys. But if you're familiar with any of this, or if you're not, uh, all of these technologies work in a similar way in that they are reliant upon centralized gatekeepers. These gatekeepers do things like assign IP addresses and domains, and none of them actually provide the email sender with any level of sovereignty. We, we essentially have this fatal flaw of choosing reputation as our delivery filtering mechanism, and the result of that is that we ended up adding a highly centralized meta protocol on top of the originally decentralized SMTP. And what's the result of that? Well, uh, over 90% of email users are now captured by five companies. That's because the level of complexity that's required to run all of this infrastructure and maintain these reputation services they, they just price out the average person. They even price out most companies and enterprises. So we ended up with these non-economic centralizing solutions to spam uh, prevention. And as of today, you can, you can abide by the SMTP protocol and try to send mail, and most of it is not even going to get to its destination. It'll claim to be accepted by an email server, but what they'll generally do is they'll just immediately black hole it drop it, and so we no longer have the reliability that uh, people are expecting. So people think of Gmail as email, but it's actually this monstrous beast. Um, you know, the unfortunate path that we've taken, it's, it's due to many small decisions over many years, but it was, a, it was a result of these decisions really bolting on solutions on top of the protocol rather than trying to fix the problem at the protocol layer itself, which was no longer really feasible due to uh, the, the ossification effects. So, you know, it, it was a long multi-decade history to go down all of these different points, uh, but we ended up at a very bad place. Now, from the user's perspective, email works great these days. However, if you want to be a sovereign email user, you are out of luck. It is just not possible. But I think the question is, and you know, why have I spent this whole time talking about email? Um, it's, I think it, sh it should be a learning lesson for us. I don't think that this was an inevitability. 
I think it was a sort of default, easy, convenient path, and it was, it was no single person's fault, but people weren't necessarily looking forward at the potential long-term consequences. So was it inevitable? I say absolutely not. There was, in fact, a proposal by some dude called Adam Back, back in 1997. You know, he looked at this problem and he said, hey, the, the problem with spam is not that we need to like filter out content and all this stuff. The problem is economic. It's that you know, we need to find a way to make sending email not so insanely cheap. We, we create an economic solution. And he used proof of work to do that. Essentially, he said, you, know, you can just add a, a little header to your, your email that includes this proof of work hash cash stamp that's based on the content. It's a unique fingerprint. It gives you some interesting properties. But essentially what it does is it tells you that whoever's sending it puts some CPU time and resources into doing it. So who cares you know, whether the recipient wants it or not? We know that we are able to curtail the flood of high volume spammers by imposing an economic cost. So you know, this, this really gets to why is ossification desirable? I, I find it very odd that we see a lot of people in this space saying, oh, Bitcoin must ossify right now. And it's, I think it's more of an emotional than a logical argument. People want ossification because they want to, they say, hey, look, look Bitcoin's working great. Let's not change it. If we change it, we might screw it up. This is a, a safety argument. And you know, we want to protect Bitcoin from potential unwanted changes, you know, an obvious one being the, the change in the supply, the block subsidy, but less obvious ones even. Now, uh, you know, you look at what's been happening with, with Taproot, tap scripts, you know, inscriptions, the, the various token mechanisms that have been created using that. Uh, you can debate whether or not it's good or bad or whatever, but what you can't debate is that this is an unintended consequence, an unintended feature. And you know, whenever you're adding things to a protocol, especially when you're allowing more programmability, there's going to be unintended consequences. It's not necessarily a bad thing, though. Um, there are risks, which is really what I'm trying to get at. It's that you know, this, especially from a security perspective, this is a dynamic environment. If you cannot change your protocol, sure, it becomes harder for some attacker to come in and break it. Well, the flip side of that is it becomes harder for the protocol itself to adapt and be modified in response to changes in the world, to changes in the environment and how the protocol is being used. Uh, you also can no longer adapt to solve new problems, at least at the protocol layer itself. So as we saw with SMTP, what happens? Well, there's going to be more problems. There's going to be demand for new solutions. If they can't happen at the protocol layer, then they're going to happen elsewhere. So do we want solutions to just get bolted on haphazardly? I would say probably not. We don't want uh, Bitcoin to morph into a similar monstrous protocol where the, there's this meta layer outside of the protocol that is, is not even specified. Uh, it becomes a much more difficult environment for people to operate in. So what do we want? You know, we want permissionless innovation. We want people to be, to be able to play around, um, to extend the protocol, and, and you know, experiment. We want them to be able to, to, to fail, and we want them to be able to succeed. Now, I think this chart is particularly interesting. You know, first of all, it does show you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum are nearly a third of all the developers in the entire space. But what I think uh, got missed and this is interesting to me, is that it looks like Ethereum probably has like four to five times more developers than Bitcoin. This should not surprise anyone who's familiar with these different protocols because you know, Ethereum is far more developer friendly. I would argue that Ethereum has a far more uh, diverse developer ecosystem, a lot of different projects, and, and even a much more diverse second layer ecosystem. Uh, I was having a conversation last night, you know, maybe these numbers are completely wrong, but one person told me that the like, layer two Ethereum ecosystem is in the like, $50 billion range of, of market value, and the layer two Bitcoin ecosystem is in the like, $2 billion range. But point being, like, probably an order of magnitude difference nearly uh, between these uh, different ecosystems. So, 
what, what, what happens if you want to try to do something more complicated on Bitcoin? Here's one particular case study of something called covenants, which basically it means uh, the ability to place restrictions upon the future flows of your Bitcoin. If you want to do that right now with the current Bitcoin protocol, you end up having to create every possible transaction and flow that that, that money could potentially go through, which means you know, if you want to do something complicated with many different logical paths, you actually have to create you know, a different transaction for every logical path. So this is like one example. Like you could potentially have dozens of different transactions that you have to pre-sign, and in some cases, to get certain security assumptions, you have to generate ephemeral private keys and then throw them away and securely delete them in order for the, the security model of this coin flow to actually uh, be usable and be something that you can rely upon. Long story short, Nobody does this. You know why? It's, it's a pain. Uh, it's just, it's not developer friendly, it's not user friendly. It's, um, it's, it's functionality that could certainly be highly valuable for certain situations, but it's just too high of a cost to be able to implement. So I don't know if anybody remembers this, this is from like seven or eight years ago. The, the original, the vision of side chains that, that we were pitched for Bitcoin was going to be, you know, a massive universe of different side chains. And you can even have, you know, side chains pegged to other side chains. It doesn't necessarily need to be a second layer. It could be a third, fourth, fifth, whatever, arbitrary number of layers away from the Bitcoin base chain, but all still cryptographically linked together, you know, having some um, ability to lean upon the, the security model of, of Bitcoin because you would be able to, you know, peg back and essentially use Bitcoin as this settlement layer. So I think some questions that we need to be asking ourselves are, you know, do we want in the long term for Bitcoin to be able to provide sovereignty to the masses, not just financial stuff? You know, this, look at emails the same way. You know, email today, yeah, people can message each other, but you can no longer be a sovereign email user. Maybe that doesn't matter. Sure, a lot of people probably don't care. I, but you know, I'm an idealist, I'm, I'm an optimist as well. I, I want us to be able to continue to provide that model. Also, how do we get a UTXO into the hands of eight billion people or something UTXO-like that can give them that same level of sovereignty? Or are we going to resign ourselves to just recreating a system of custodians because it's not possible to scale Bitcoin that way? Uh, I think that it is possible. We need to be treating Bitcoin, at least at the base layer, as a cryptographic accumulator. So I also wanted to look more at what has happened to the sidechain ecosystem. I wanted to give you folks uh, a lot of interesting charts and metrics and graphs. Guess what? They don't exist. Nobody is charting sidechain metrics because they don't think it's worth their time. There's not enough activity. This is not like a slam on anyone who's working on sidechains. I'm just saying the vision has not gotten there. Uh, you know, you have multiple services out there providing data and metrics for many different protocols and networks. As far as I can tell, none of them are doing it for any of the side chains because they just don't think it's worth their time. There's not demand for it. Um, you look at like the money that is, has been pegged into side chains, it's like around 3,000 Bitcoin on, on Liquid, around 3,000 on Rootstock. It's not nothing, but compared to some of these other uh, networks and protocols, you know, it's just not uh, keeping up you know, a competitive pace. Uh, what else do we want? You know, we want to be able to continue to evolve the security. Why should we settle for the, the security that's currently available with Bitcoin? There's so much more that we could do. So uh, for an example, uh, key management still sucks. It's very brittle. I've been working on that problem for eight years. Um, there's a missing, completely missing side to Bitcoin security that we don't have that's kind of related to the covenant stuff I was talking about. We don't have the ability to react to uh, degradations in our security in Bitcoin. Right now, you have to construct insanely high you know, walls to keep an attacker away from getting your, your uh, private keys. But if they manage to get enough of your private keys, it's game over, man. It's catastrophic loss. Uh, people don't want to have to deal with that threat. If you had a way to you know, claw back your funds because you had covenants, you had vaults, whatever, that would give people more peace of mind. It would give people the confidence that they can be their own bank. So we want to prevent ossification. You know, there's standard ways that people recommend doing this. Uh, one of them is to encrypt data so that it's just not being verified. Of course, that's a non-starter if we're doing consensus protocols. 
Um, you hear a lot of talk about extension points. Extensions, uh, that can work for a narrow portion of protocols, but uh, in practice, you, you can never like perfectly prevent ossification across the entire protocol. HTTP, HTTP headers are one example uh, that have avoided ossification, um, but that's only because people just ignore the unrecognized ones. So I think in terms of extensions, you know, op nops and soft forks, that's what we've been doing, but it doesn't work in the long term. It becomes harder and harder. I think we need stuff like drive chains and rollups. We need the ability to have completely separate networks and environments that are tied to Bitcoin where people can do their innovation. Uh, and, and of course, there's just a velocity problem. If we, if we stop keeping pushing forward, it becomes harder and harder to uh, make changes. So what do we want? I'm not pushing for any one specific solution. I want all the solutions. We need optionality. We need builders to have a platform with many different types of functionality and extensibility and the ability to innovate and to, to take risks and, and to take risks in a way that's not going to uh, you know, be a risk to Bitcoin itself. So you know, we need to look at ossification as something that will happen, not something that we want to happen as soon as possible. Uh, because we could be shooting ourselves in the foot. What do we want? We want developers. We want to get those numbers up. Come on, folks. These, these, these numbers are not good. Uh, we're not competing well on the, the developer side. So we need more developers. And, and in order to get more developers, we need to be more developer friendly. So in conclusion, we have to keep building. We cannot rest upon our laurels. Bitcoin is not inevitable. It is not inevitable that Bitcoin will win all of the things, especially if we stop building on top. So, thank you. Woo.